Hello magpies, and welcome back to the Social Justice Player's Handbook. A horoscope for good and bad activists through the lens of Dungeons and Dragons. The, hero, the heroes are looking a little outnumbered today because we have one hero and two villains to cover. It's time to swoop it up, buttercup. Let us begin. Next class is the backbone of the party, for I cannot overstate the value of clerics. Many see her as a backline support character, but this is a grave misconception. Clerics boast skills that suit party leaders, tanks, damage dealers, scouts, and yes, healers and backline support if that's her choice. Regardless, I can say with absolute certainty that any party graced by a cleric will enjoy significantly enhanced longevity. Her character trait is that she is the quest giver. But do not mistake this for NPC behaviour. Clerics are the educators, the academics, the activists, the researchers, and the administrators who discover villainy, who delineate heroes, who formulate responses, and who articulate the critical theories that make the possibility for a better world more than an idyllic fantasy. People often assume her duty is to support heroes, but I would argue that everyone has a duty to support clerics. Without her, Literally, none of this would even be possible. She sets the agenda for the rest of us to advance. Collectively, clerics have authored the critical theories that have revolutionized the world, but individually she plays her part in a larger machine. Upon the shoulders of giants she can see far, she builds her work on the back of every academic who has ever reached for the stars. And, in turn, she makes room on her platform to support those who come after. Do not make the mistake of viewing challenges to her sermons as merely discrediting them. For each antithesis paves the way for a new synthesis. And the conversation evolves to suit the needs of the age. Faith in the process. Faith, this ranks among her greatest strengths. And it is necessary for everything she does. Advancing the macro through her micro specialization, it is not uncommon, provided she is given the chance to advance in her order, or each cleric to become a world leader in their specialty topic. This demands a big cathedral and a diversity of tactics through many diverse hands at work. Collectively, she and her ilk author the spells that wizards memorize and recite, and she draws up the battle lines by which a warrior knows that they stand on the right side of history. She is, but a pebble in a pond, but by the emanation of ripples, she is legion in ways she cannot even see. Most admirable is her service to the greater good, and in a just society she would be reimbursed and revered like a sports star. As an expert in the humanities, she is a lifelong student and an admirer of humanity. They are the object of her study after all. Indeed, the education of the youth is her bread and butter, and without faith in the capacity for good or in the potential for social change that we cannot presently see, what would be the point? of any of it. For if we abandon the promises of the Enlightenment, what kind of dark future do we resign ourselves to? 
Her weakness is that the demands of academic rigor require her to move very slowly through checks, balances and red tape to ensure her work is ethical, apt and salient. Without accountability to sources and without peer review, her work is in limbo. Meaningful revolution without bloodshed is incremental, generational, and incompatible with the speed at which we sometimes need to move at to fight against impending villainy. Many clerics never even get to go on adventures and must direct parties from afar. The institutions in which they operate are often exploitative, ruled by old money in the shadows of dead empires and offer very few opportunities for tenure. She must teach, she must mark her students' barely literate manuscripts, she must attend staff meetings, she must edit and review manuscripts of billion dollar journals who then pocket all of the proceeds of her labour, she must constantly reapply for her own position and then, and then maybe, if she burns the candle at both ends, she may find the time to do the research that justifies her existence. Small wonder then that her critical weakness is that she is utterly unappreciated. Sorcerers vacillate between accusing her of being an ineffectual snowflake pushing obvious lies and in the next breath of being a domineering cult leader and a henchman of ivory tower cabals. Her students act like their bad grades are her fault, and the university bean counters demand of her to publish or to perish. Many academics are thus forced out, they give up or they find a much easier and more profitable life shilling for big corporations and conservative think tanks. Or just figure out that it's a lot easier to start the conclusion and work backwards passing off any old language as science to an unsuspecting audience. These cowards fall into two categories, warlocks and necromancers. Warlocks on the face of it have little in common with clerics, except for their service to something bigger than themselves. With clerics it's service to the idea of progress, but for a warlock it's enough to simply provide legitimacy and cover for whatever her corporate patrons want to achieve. There's really not much more to say than that. Everything else is downstream of service to her masters. Where, cl where clerics struggle to make ends meet and must justify their research to penny-pinching committees, warlocks have access to wealth directly proportional to how badly their patrons want an outcome. While clerics only teach those lucky enough to receive a tertiary education, Warlocks can market their aesthetics of scientific rigor to an audience that isn't equipped to critique bad science. And finally, by working for the status quo and from fortified positions, Warlocks are always at a rhetorical advantage. After all, it's so much easier to deny science than to prove it. However, the qualities that make a warlock a good soldier also render her dangerous to her patron. Though she is outwardly powerful and convincing, if you scratch beneath the surface you will find that she is nothing more than a regular person who has been given extraordinary powers to mislead the public. If you give her a strong enough appeal to her self-preservation or to her profit motives, Warlocks can flip on their masters as easily as breathing and without a second thought. The critical weakness of a warlock is her reliance on a patron. 
Often she is being used as a distraction. If you take her down, her patron can simply imbue more servants with wealth and prestige. You need to go after the corporations and institutions that she works for. And in that way, you can cut her off from her power at the source. This is easier said than done though, unfortunately. The other version of a fallen cleric is the necromancer. This would-be academic tied her entire ideology to an idea that has now been struck down so many times it is well and truly dead. But she keeps breathing new life into bad ideas, time and time again. Her fundamental character trait is a kind of transcendental fortitude that defies law and reason. It's like a bunch of kids playing soldiers, and there's one kid who keeps going, nah, -uh, you missed, no matter what happens. Except that this kid is now all grown up and has realized that she actually can get away with denying of observable reality. You ever see a debate with somebody who doesn't make a single good point and at the end stands up and cheers that she won because she never conceded defeat? You and I, well, we might laugh at her, but what we don't see is that her audience fully thinks that she did one just as a consequence of the aesthetic she emanates of irreverent strength. Ignoring necromancers doesn't make them go away, and in many cases it just gives her time to mobilize her army of shambling zombies to do her bidding. Indeed, conflict and culture war nonsense are her bread and butter. The more pointless fights she gets into, the more she can find reactionaries who want their politics dumped down to her level and are willing to join whatever group gives them a sense of belonging without demanding from them introspection. Her weaknesses are as slippery as she is. By being performatively stupid, she can communicate very effectively to the undereducated and to exploit them to do her bidding. Cults are very hard to break up and at the end of the day nobody knows that they are being brainwashed until years later when they look back on their past selves and cringe. To get out of a cult you have to want to leave. No matter how much abuse you suffer at the hands of the cult, once they have isolated you from your support networks, they have you. In this way, necromancers implicitly encourage their followers to make themselves weaker, so that they are less able to survive in the real world. Which lucky, luckily for us though, this is key to understanding the necromancer's critical weakness. Sunlight, touching grass, and positive face-to-face -face social connections, these are her kryptonite. Weaponizing ignorance and victimhood doesn't work if the most vulnerable people in society have good support networks such as healthcare, welfare, and social networks that extend beyond the nuclear family. If people can earn a living wage and still have time for hobbies, then they don't have to choose between survival and happiness, and education will follow. The necromancer thrives off misery, so the key to her defeat is revolutionary intersectional transformation of our society, of our urban planning, of our economy, and of our priorities. Think of necromancers as a boss fight that gets easier, the better the world becomes. Thank you, magpies, and I must say, shit's getting real. 
The battle lines are drawn, and it's nearly time to turn the paradigm on its head. I hope you will join me next time on the Social Justice Player's Handbook.